Hello, everyone. My name is Dave Gutierrez. I'm the writer and the author of the book, Patriots from the Barrio. And I'm here today with Scott Petrie, who is a high school teacher at John F. Kennedy High School in Granada Hills, California. Now, Scott's students or his school became the first school in the nation to use Patriots from the Barrio as part of their World War II lessons. Uh, Scott and I have presented together at the California Council for Social Studies conference. And for those of you that are not familiar with that conference, it's a conference where social studies teachers throughout California get together once a year and they get the opportunity to attend a conference and learn about what other, high, um, what other teachers are doing. Um, it's sort of a, they get together and learn from each other uh, during this conference. So uh, I'm not going to talk a lot today in this uh, little interview. Uh, I want to hand it over to uh, Scott and share with us, Scott. Um, first of all, thank you for taking the time to do this uh, with us. And uh, the floor is yours, sir. All right. Well, thank you, my friend. As always, um, I'm delighted to uh, speak about your book uh, and the experiences I've had with my students in reading your book. It was a real treat when a couple years ago we get to have you fly down and spend the day in our library and teach kids about genealogy and how to do research into family histories. And I remember uh, one of the students, uh, when we first read the book that first year, um, just identified with all the nicknames in the story. And she said, wow, it, it sounds like my family. We have all these nicknames for each other and we're always referring to each other by nicknames. And uh, that's when the kind of big light bulb went off, like, aha, this is what happens when kids are reading stuff that's about them mm -hmm. and that they connect with. And so, um, you know, I, it, it's been interesting. I love uh, teaching reading in secondary schools. And one of the big problems with it is as text complexity goes up, the actual amount of reading instruction we give goes down. Uh. And um, most teachers just want to throw the book at the kid and say, okay, read. Uh, and then there's usually some test at the end of the whole reading, mm. um, but there's no real checking for understanding along the way. And so I've been able to kind of experiment over the last couple of years. Um, and uh, unfortunately the pandemic last year prevented me from using the book in class. And, um, what has bothered me about this, uh, the whole remote teaching is I don't wanna give my kids electronic books cause that's just more time on a screen. Hmm. But you know, schools don't have the money to go out and buy 2000 books so that every 11th grader in the, or every person in the school can, can read the book. So uh, this year when I saw your presentation at the National World War II Museum, and thanks for the shout out, <laughs> um, it, you know, it, it really uh, wa it made me want to start teaching the book again. And one of the things that I've done this year is I'll ask the kids kind of a general statement before we go into a unit. Mm -hmm. So I asked them, well, what do you know about Mexican Americans in World War II? And, you know, their answers were just like, oh, I, I know nothing about Mexican-Americans in World War II. There were Mexican-Americans in World War II. And uh, I'm going to share a couple of their answers with you if I can get my Zoom right. You know, so I've basically asked them these questions. And I got back essentially 160 of the same responses that all basically said, uh, I know nothing about Mexicans in World War II. And so then we went through the Medal of Honor winners. Mm -hmm. And uh, this was one of my favorite parts right here where I asked the kids, um, now that we have read about the Medal of Honor winners, and we've read the first couple chapters from Patriots. We've listened to them with the audiobook. Uh, you know, how many pages do you think your textbook has about Mexican Americans? 
uh, or Latinos and their service. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can see their answers here, about 30 pages, at least five front and back 10 pages, at least a chapter. This kid says 13 to 16 uh, books or uh, pages. And so you catch all of their responses. <laughs> and then I ask them, uh, let's see. right here, uh, yeah, how much space should your book dedicate? How much space uh, should it dedicate to Mexican repatriation, which you cover quite well in the book, mm -hmm. and then Mexican Americans in World War II as a whole? Well, when I show this to my kids, they're just uh, incensed. And here you have it, there's about 40% uh, of a page, almost half of a page on uh, Mexican American repatriation, which it never really names. Uh, but it mentions is at, at the end of the paragraph. And then there is a total of three sentences on Mexican Americans in World War II, um, even though the, the book covers about 60 pages to World War II. Wow, yeah. So uh, I really um, like the way you frame it for our students and say, you know, it's time for Latinos or Mexican Americans to write their own histories because nobody's going to do it for us. Right. And so I think your book is what uh, English teachers would call a, a mentor text about how to write about your family histories, how to write about Mexican American contributions to America as a whole. And that's really my uh, secret plan in using it is mm -hmm. I want to show them what good writing it looks like and then how you structure the story. And I've done this you know, several ways. Like one of the things I, I ask my students to do on 9-11 is they have to do an interview with their parents about where were they on 9-11. Oh, oh, nice. And I've been doing this every year for a number of years because it gets further and further away from mm -hmm. our children's mind, minds. Mm -hmm. um, and now the kids I'm having, they weren't even born when 9-11 happened. So, uh, and, and I remember the first year I did this, almost every single Latino parent said, Oh, Bush did 9-11. <laughs> and I thought, wow, is this just a, a conspiracy that, you know, involved the Latino community or wh what was it about? Mm -hmm. And I, tr I tried to go a little deeper, uh, but I was just kind of profoundly struck that every year they would say that. And so then I added a piece to it where they have to fact check the things their parents say with the actual 9-11 report. Mm. So the parent might have said something uh, about Bush being involved, but then they can't find any actual evidence of it in the report. Or the parent might say, oh, it happened at like noon on the East Coast. Uh, mm -hmm. And then they look up the actual time and stuff like that. So the fact checking, I think, is a really good strategy from this uh, whole experience. And it's, it's something that they need to know because a lot of my kids, they see it on the internet, they believe it must be true. And they <laughs> don't put any effort into, can I find two or three or four other sources that all say the same thing? Sure, sure. like a reference, yeah. yeah exactly. So, um, but I, I do wanted to, uh, I wanted to share with you just okay here it is i'm gonna i'm gonna bring it up uh because i think in the the prologue to the book you talk about how um you know you're, you're you basically leave it as an open-ended question as to where you're gonna start the book hmm. and uh so oops, i'm gonna go back here okay so I, I use this paragraph right here where you're talking about the whole semantic debate. Do people right. want to be called Hispanic, Latino, Chicano, Mexican-American, all of this. Uh, and so I asked the kids, how would you describe yourself if you were writing your own story? And then I asked them a second question of where will, they, will, where will Dave start the book? right? Because uh, you leave it on this nice sentence right here, which is kind of a cliffhanger. You know, for millions of Americans, this story can only start in one place. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, it'd be interesting to see uh, what responses they have. And they all jump in to, 
you know, how they view themselves. And as I read through these, I'm just really struck with how proud of their heritage they are. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is what, where we need to start history. <laughs> uh, and like this, this young student, I thought did a really good job. She says, I, cl I will classify myself as Mexican, although I'm considered Mexican American. I've never identified myself as that because I feel like I've never felt that term. Um, so I never called myself Mexican American. I also don't like being classified as Hispanics uh, because I myself don't think Hispanic is the right term to classify people from Latin America. Um, and, and then this part really struck with me right here where she comes down and says, uh, I'm grateful for the, this is not to say that I'm not grateful for the opportunities this country has offered my family and me, but more recently, I find it more hard to say that I'm proud as I grow older. I see, uh, so she's talking about, you know, verse being Mexican American versus being American. Right. And I think that a lot of our kids need to explore this concept in a safe way. And one of the things that I try to do as a history teacher is lump the whole, uh, in, in fact, with all the Asian American attacks of, of recently that have been in the news and the George Floyd trial that's now in the news, you know, what I try and teach mm -hmm. students is that uh, attacks against one of us are attacks against all of us. Mm -hmm. And so anytime a group is being singled out uh, for hate or scapegoated, you really have to ask yourself why, what's the agenda, who's the larger group that's doing this, and, and why is this becoming, because uh, I worry it's becoming more and more part of our political process. Right. That, the way to get elected is to demonize another group and then say, you're gonna save everybody. Right. So, um, you know, I, I really think your book helps students talk about their identity mm -hmm. and the hope that they have moving forward as young adults. Uh, and, and certainly what they're gonna study as they move into, uh, usually these are 11th graders I'm teaching. So they're applying to colleges and they're starting to think about what do I want to study in college? Mm -hmm. So I think uh, this is a perfect time to get them with your book and say, okay, you know, here's one guy who decided to write about his family history and it became something bigger. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times when you're starting off investigating a topic, it might blow up into something bigger as well. Right. And um, so I, I just want to share the screen a little bit because I've, I've done a lot of work with this other company called ListenWise mm. and they market uh, and, and sell these, this listening platform that uh, is, it, uh, it basically takes national public radio content and aligns it to the content uh, standards for social studies and then it gives students listening tasks and they have all these various list organizers. So students can uh, write down and take notes as they're listening. And the nice thing about it is all the stories are usually only about three to five to seven minutes long. And then they have written discussion questions on those stories and they have written little quizzes. And as your students take these quizzes, they start to build their own little listening profile. So I, I know what students struggle with when they're listening. And so I've kind of stolen their idea here and I, I've created these little listening guides and the early chapters of the book are all about 15, uh, 15 minutes long. Hmm. So what we'll do is we'll listen to it and I'll say, okay, in this segment, I want you listening for Hernan Cortez, Ignacio Allende, Porforio Diaz, and write down, you know, what you think we should know about these references. Mm -hmm. And what I've found as I've taught reading nonfiction over the past few years is in almost every nonfiction book, the author throws about a hundred people at you in the first 100 pages. <laughs> And for struggling readers, that's like, oh my God, that's too much. How can I keep track of everybody? Right. Uh, and so what I found is if you break it down and give them a guide, 
give them sort of a scorecard, then they can tell who's who. Right. And it's much easier for them as they read it. And so yeah. a lot of times what I'll do is I'll give them all of the people that are mentioned in the book or the, the main people. Uh, and you shared this with me. These are the soldiers that were in Company E and their nickname. And then I have them record some important details. That's so a, as they're reading, they note the page number each person's on and they uh, jot down a few just details about them. And we can build this as sort of a crowdsourced document as we go. Mm. And um, this is much easier when kids are reading. They have the physical book. Well, I didn't have the physical book this year. I've just had the um, audio copy. Audio book. Okay. So, and the interesting thing for me too is now that I'm listening to the story, and by the way, the, the voiceover guy does a tremendous job with it. Yeah. He's really good. Manuel Lara, right? Yes. How did you come to meet him or how did... Uh... Well, they contacted me as because he, he was given the task of, of doing this, mm -hmm. uh, of being the narrator for this book. And he just wanted to talk to me a, a little bit about it, wanted to make sure that, you know, certain pronunciations were, were, were being done. Like he had originally had uh, Bowie, Bowie High School. Okay. And... Uh, <laughs> And uh, anyone, anyone in the state of Texas will look at you kind of cross-eyed if they ever heard that. So I had to tell them that, you know, this is, this is, this is the way they, they would pronounce uh, Bowie High School um, in, in South Texas, <laughs> especially in the barrios of El Paso. So in order to be authentic for them, uh, we, had, we had to go and, and do a change of that. But he was really good. I, I mean... When I first listened to it, he sent me a, a few samples of it, and I, I got goosebumps because it's the first time I, I'm hearing someone read out loud uh, words that that I put down on, on you know in a book. Right. So it was amazing to hear, and then his accent comes. I mean, he's he's Cuban, and uh, and he he comes off really really well. Yeah, and it was funny because, you know, I've, I've read your book several times and I certainly dive in deeper at some points than others. Mm -hmm. But um, when I listened to this chapter one again, uh, this one line just jumped out at me where, um, you know, you talk about there was no wire or gate at the border to keep one out. There was just an imaginary line that separated the two countries an imaginary line that separated hope from despair. Mm -hmm. And that just hit me as such a great line when I listened to it that I kind of just skipped right over when I read it. <laughs> um, and so it, 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 it's very interesting to me. Uh, and, and what I've learned with this pandemic too is usually I'll re read about 30 to 40 books a year. Uh, but 90% of that reading takes place as I'm in my car driving to school. Yeah, yeah. And this year uh, with the pandemic, I just, I have so much that I did not read because I missed that half hour there and a half yeah. hour back. Yeah, yeah. And um, so I was pleased that I got the audio book and I was able to share it with my students. And basically... You know, it takes us maybe a half hour to get through a 15 minute chapter and I stop it three or four times. And then I ask them about the people. What did you write down? What did you write down? What did you think of this? What did you think of it? And, um, you know, in an era where with Zoom school, the major complaint from teachers is you ask a question and there's no one there. You just get ghosted, right? The kids are playing video game. They're in another room. You don't see them. You don't hear them. Right. Um, but what I've been excited about is the kids are there and the kids mm -hmm. are listening and they have their opinions and uh, they're really engaged with the listening to the reading. And I'm used to when I teach the book in summer school or teach it in my regular class, I'm used to I have to walk around the room and say, put your cell phone away, yeah, and, right. you know, kind of uh, wake up these kids who are just using it as an excuse to nap or mm -hmm. uh, the kids who are fooling around and passing notes to each other. That still happens. <laughs> um, 
And, and so with the listening, I can't really tell if they're there, but then when I ask a question, they all respond. Hmm. So that to me has been really gratifying and I've enjoyed some of the learning that I've taken from this ListenWise platform uh, in to put it into reading instruction. And some of the interesting that research that they've come up with uh, is especially useful for ELs that are struggling readers. Um, and the, the facts that you can, you can actually listen and understand or comprehend uh, content that's two grade levels above what you would normally read. Mm. And it has these benefits, especially for English language learners, because the words are pronounced correctly and they're used in the right context. So the kid, even if they don't know what the word means, they can kind of figure it out because the uh, author is using it in the correct context. Yeah. So, so the audio book has really helped then. Uh, I, I think so. And I'm, I'm debating, you know, I've gotten through the first two chapters with them. And then, of course, spring break hit. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, am I going to be able to get through how much more of the book am I going to be able to get through? Yeah, yeah. Um, because, you know, the, the teenage boys, what they love learning about World War II is all the bang, bang, shoot yeah. up stuff. And so um, I've been trying to, to figure out which of those later chapters, like 16, 17, or 18, huh. are going to be the best ones to uh, satisfy the action movie enthusiast. Right, right. Can you uh, put up your slide again for the, the one that you had previous with your audio? Sure. So, uh, so what I have done, we have a, a program that the school purchased. It's called Pear Deck. And what Pear Deck does is it makes your slideshow interactive. So uh, this is like the slide I would create. Uh, and um, what I do when they're listening is they would read, uh, but I have the little map of Del Rio and Ciudad Acuna uh -huh. uh, and uh, the city of Allende. So they can see just how far all these places are. And then I updated, you know, when, when you, the book is taking place in 1901, there's only 5,200 people here. But in 2010, there's almost 50,000. Right, right. So I like giving the kids a visual while they're listening. And then they also have that listening guide that we're going through. And then afterwards, I just ask them to write about okay, we've, we've heard Crescencio's story. We know his wife died, he had two sons. Uh, what, what happens, what do you write down about his life between 1901 and 1921? And so they all just kind of summarize the chapter and they usually do a, a pretty good job. Well, this, this is really amazing, uh, Scott, for, for, for me and my family to know that high school students uh, in your classroom are learning about my two times great grandfather, <laughs> Crescencio Gutierrez. That is amazing. You know, when I read, when I wrote the book, I wanted to have a part of our family history out there. And, you know, just so if somebody were to come across my book and learn a little bit about that, you've taken it to a whole nother level. And now high school students are in, in Southern California are learning about the San Felipe Barrio of Del Rio, Texas, Val Verde County. I mean, that's amazing. Uh, excellent work. So in, in one of my favorites is, uh, this is called in education, the spacing effect. And it's kind of repeated uh, repetition and spacing things out like a day or two at a time gives students a chance to think about it and process it. And it kind of marinates in your subconscious. So the next day, I asked them before we start reading chapter two, I asked them to explain how Cortez, Allende, and Diaz all influenced Crescencio's decisions to leave Mexico. Yeah. And this is all pure speculation on their part, but it kind of taps into their prior knowledge about what do you know about these people. Mm -hmm. And um, it gets the kids to remember that paying attention to the reading, paying attention to the listening is actually teaching you the historical content. Wow, wow. So um, yeah, this is just, and, and this doesn't take long. This takes maybe, 
I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes to set up before the class. Mm -hmm. um, and so again, as they're oh, listening, <laughs> they're, they're getting a little bit of a visual about these people that we're gonna learn about. And so after we've heard from these people uh, or heard about these people, I can ask them, what did you think was important? What did you write down? Mm -hmm. And so this holds them accountable and it also helps them listen to each other. Uh, and, you know, it's been a really interesting way to present the book uh, from an, instead of instead of just the traditional reading. And you'll remember that last year or two years ago, I guess, uh, when I actually had the kids reading it in class, mm -hmm. um, I wrote all of these test questions and I would give them sort of a multiple choice test on each chapter. And I use this online platform that's kind of a game and it's fun for the kids. But, you know, there's more, than li more to life than multiple choice tests. <laughs> and I know they won't be reading and note taking at the same level since they're listening because there's a lot of research that shows you only remember about 20% of what you listen to. Mm. And so I'm looking for tricks to kind of get them A, engaged in the text uh, be learning something from it, and then see kind of having like a, a call to action moment where they've heard you talk about, okay, it's your responsibility to write your own life story. <laughs> and, um, you know, I, I would say that the kids are pretty enthusiastic about it. And when I get them to talk about uh, World War II, I guess what I really... It, in education speak, this is called an anticipation guide, mm. because now when I'm, we're talking about World War II uh, and they hear the names of the people that they've read in the book, they're like, oh, wait, I know something. And they kind of sit up a little straighter and they're like, oh, I remember this. And, you know, that's really the hard part of teaching history is how do they make the connections from mm. the people to this event to a larger event. Mm. And we experienced that when we went through all the Medal of Honor winners. And uh, I want to say like four out of the 14 Medal of Honor winners all won the medal at the same Battle of Luzon in the Philippines. <laughs> and so, you know, that led to a great discussion of how do people get these medals? Mm -hmm. And oh, they're written a commendation by their commanding officer. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, why do we think that uh, so many, you know, only 14 Latinos have gotten the Medal of Honor compared to like 3,000 yeah. uh, white folks? And so why is that? Uh, because for maybe whatever reason, those commanding officers didn't put in the commendation. Mm -hmm. And you could see how when you study just those 14 Medal of Honor winners, that if four out of the 14 got them from the same battle, a, it must have been a hell of a battle. Um, but B, they must have had a commanding officer that was a good writer yes. <laughs> and wanted to wanted yeah. to promote his men, right? Yes. yes. Um, so that's kind of important for them to, to look at is that, oh, there might be other factors in play here other than just institutional racism, structural racism. Right. You know, uh, and when when they're listening to stories about people who served in Afghanistan and Iraq, you know, who's writing those stories? Who's telling their side? Mm -hmm. um, because if, if you're not doing that, you're maybe doing a disservice. Yeah. So. Awesome. And, you know, I, I guess just to, to wrap it up, um, you know, what, what I'm going to say is, you uh, each time I read the book, I interact with the book, I listen to the book, I kind of learn new ways to teach about it. Mm. And, um, you know, the goal for me with reading is to get them to like reading. And I've never experienced that with the history book. Kids mm -hmm. don't like to read the history book. It was <laughs> written by a committee and it's boring. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but I love finding these stories and the heroic stories within this. Mm -hmm. I'll just share uh, one other piece. Um, so I, I'm sure you've read this book. In the oh, end. yeah. Uh, so on, on page 29, there's a story of this young uh, kid 
uh, Adolfo Salea, right? Name right, and he uh, details. It's a story about how these older Texas rednecks, bigger Texas rednecks, uh, would demean him and uh, taunt him. And then one day he kind of snapped and punched one of them. And, um, you know, it's a nice two page sequence where he goes down and he gets uh, medical attention because the bone's poking out of his hand. Yeah. And uh, as it cuts off, you know, uh, he hears this, he's, he's leaving the sick bay, he's going back to his bunk, and uh, all of a sudden he hears the whine of propellers and acceleration, and he freezes, he turns his head skyward, and he sees a suicide plane headed straight for the ship. And when I close the book, and that's it, the kids are like, what? Stop, what? I'm like, oh, the bell's going to ring, you know? <laughs> We gotta go. We gotta go. And so they they really um, love those cliffhanging moments. And you know, there's just something about good writing that when you it gets your it gets your hook it gets its hooks into you, mm -hmm. and you can't put the book down. And I remember after I I read this section, the kids are like, "What's the name of that book again? I have to go buy it." Yeah. And yeah. You don't get those moments very often as a teacher. Yeah, yeah. And I, I know I've shared this with you before, but you know, I, I got thank yous from a bunch of parents when we read Patriots. And I heard from families that I went out and I bought a copy and my dad read it. And then my dad bought a copy for his father and my grandfather read it. And so um, it's probably not the quick, quickest way to the best selling list, but um, you know, slowly but surely, I hope you're building an audience. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to the TV series. I hope you have good news about that coming soon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What well, I find is when you can pair a book and it's on TV or it's in the movies. Yeah. Oh, now you have even greater buy-in from the students too. Yes, yes. They can. They have another uh, platform for them to to see the story. Yeah, and, and especially if. You know, if, if they're going to put it on TV and 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 they're going to be able to stream it somewhere and they're going to be able to watch it, yeah, uh, absolutely, I could see that. Well, again, thank you for all of the work that you're doing. Uh, what is it? This is your third year now uh, that you're. This, this is will be my third, third year, but I got I got skipped in the second year because I wasn't able to teach it because all the books were locked up in my room mm -hmm. and I was at home teaching on the computer. Right, right. So the Audible just came in right on time. So, yeah. I will say, and that's where I found the other stuff that's on your blog, like the Ilario Garcia, and I started oh. presenting some of that, like with the by the numbers and having the yes. kids do number graphics and read about that and write about that. You have that slide up? Oh, because I have it. Okay. I have it up. I, do, I don't have it up. I'm okay. sorry. Okay, yeah. So uh, give us a give us a a rundown of how you used uh, this article that I wrote on a Mexican-American uh, Marine who was killed in action on Iwo Jima. So this was an, um, uh, a great, I, I was delighted to see you talk about this in the uh, World War II Museum talk, because I've used this a couple of times um, where students, it's kind of a formative assessment where students have to retell the story. Mm -hmm. And so I just give them a link to the excerpt of the, of the blog post that you did. Mm -hmm. And I give them this template that you can click on and then they get to make, they get to pick the pictures and pick the numbers. And I ask them to tell the story. Thank you, Sam. Tell the story, um, you know, in their own way. And if you click through some of, uh, I will say, you know, this is my uh, handicap from being a doctoral student is you have to measure everything. <laughs> so I have to measure how many graphics did you put on the slide? How many sources did you use? Um, that That's just a way to grade kids and say, mm -hmm. okay, if I was going to split this and do an A, B, and C, where would I put the lines? Mm -hmm. But if you go to the actual infographics on the next slide, what I learned to do this year was to 
uh, give the students, uh, ask them the next day to come back and look at their infographic and then write a self-assessment about it. How good of a job did you do telling this person's story with numbers? Wow. And so, and, and this is something that I've realized, you know, with regular school, we meet for an hour a day and I see the kids every day, five days a week. But with online Zoom school, we meet every other day for 70 minutes. Hmm. So like if I see a, a class on Friday, I don't see them again until the next Wednesday. Oh, wow. Okay. They've forgotten everything we did on Friday. <laughs> so what I've tried to do is I'll give them one period where they make something like this. Mm -hmm. And then another period, the opening activity is review what you did the last time you were here. Yeah. And that kind of brings it back in their brain and reminds them of what they did. And I would say my students really enjoy these. This is called a number mania or infographic or by the numbers. And it's a good reading activity because they're pulling the most important facts out and they're visualizing them. So, and for some reason, people are just drawn to numbers in these icons. And so they really have... It's just another way for, for kids to learn and how to document what they're, what they're reading. Uh, again, fascinating that students at your high school are learning about uh, a Mexican-American who was from the barrios of San Diego and sacrificed uh, his life dur during the Battle of, of Iwo Jima. And the reason why I wrote this is because this, it was the 75th anniversary mm -hmm. of Iwo Jima. And I was, I was, again, I was starting to wonder how many uh, Mexican-American lives or Hispanic lives uh, were lost at Iwo Jima that we're never ever going to hear about. And uh, this, this name, I was going through the casualty list and this state name just jumped out at me for whatever reason. And I started doing research, did genealogy research again, connected with the family. And uh, well, they're all very thrilled and they're, they're gonna be ecstatic to learn that their relative is part of classroom uh, curriculum. Uh, so again, thank you. Yeah, and uh, you know, I did my undergrad down in San Diego. So I lived down there for 11 years. And then a couple of years ago when the California Council for Social Studies Conference was down there, we actually did a walking tour of the Logan Heights Barrio and looked at all of the artwork and the murals and, right. and things like that. So I think that's why that reading jumped out at me. And I said, oh, I gotta use this. <laughs> Um, and again, I always kind of tell people, I'm, I'm not a very good history teacher. Uh, I'm more of a reading teacher and yeah. I'm more of a used car salesman because it's like, what do I got to do to get you to read today? <laughs> uh, what do I got to do to get you to buy this car today? Not tomorrow, today. And so I just kind of continually come up with tricks and steal from other people about how do I get them to read about this person and what can they do that convinces me they've actually read about it. Well, you, you have a strong following on Twitter. Uh, um, probably a lot of your social media uh, platforms where other teachers are following you and learning. I've had a lot of teachers come, hey, I heard that Scott was doing this. What can you tell me more? I mean, we've had, uh, th thanks to your work, uh, in, in being really the leader in, in getting Patriots in the body in, in, in schools. We've had Gabriel Enriquez from Santa Paula High School uh, introduce the book to his, to his class. Uh, I've, I've done presentations here locally at Andrew Hill High School. I was scheduled to go to Mills High School in Millbrae before the pandemic hit. Uh, but we're, we're, gonna, we're gonna get that done uh, here pretty shortly. Um, to do presentations at these high schools. So again, thank thank you very much for all of your work. And I did want to share one other one other goodie here with. Am, am I sharing? Oh, yep, yep, I can see it. Well, so for for people to realize, um, uh, Scott was recently awarded the outstanding high high. High School Social Studies Teacher of the Year by the California Council for Social Studies. 
And as people are are witnessing through this interview uh, chat with 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 you and I, they realize what you're doing, and this is an honor well deserved. Uh, so I applaud you again, and um, thank you for all of your work, and uh, really uh, being the catalyst for for having Patriots in the Body in our schools. And I'm hoping that teachers in in Texas. Uh, see this and realize that, hey, uh, here's one teacher who's made a difference in, in, his, in his classroom. And, uh, you know, here's a big piece of Texas history uh, that's being actually taught in Southern California. Yep. Again, it's that culturally responsive pedagogy. You know, you have to you have to know who your audience is and you have to give them stuff that validates them being important. So uh, I really uh, enjoy, and I, I have taught in LA USD my whole career. Uh, my population is 80 to 85% Latino. And I have just learned that if you are respectful and polite to students, they return the favor. And uh, my students, uh, even with this pandemic, they have gone above and beyond what I have expected of them. And uh, despite what you read in the newspapers about, uh, oh, this learning loss and oh, this horrible um, pandemic, uh, I've had 80% or more of my students are doing exceptionally well. And I, I am worried about the 20% that are kind of fumbling in the dark and not very engaged. Uh, but I'm hopeful that we're turning the corner and we'll, we'll get back into face and fit to face instruction and be able to do more. What I worry about is I, I've bought these books over the last, I don't know, five years and I'm a hoarder where I have class sets of books and I try and teach my kids to read uh, two books per semester. Right. And I'm worried that now we're not going to be able to share them. And instead of having like a class set of 40 copies, <laughs> I'm going to have to convince my principal to buy 200 copies so I can give each kid a book that they can take home and all that. So yeah. Yeah. tell your publisher there's good news coming, I guess. Yeah, some good news coming. yeah he'll like that. <laughs> Scott, thanks again for your time, uh, for all of the work that you're doing. Uh, if there's anything that we can do to continually help you, just let us know. So, uh, All right, Dave. Thanks so much.